Hi, I'm William Spaniel. Let's learn some game theory. Today's topic is the centipede game. I cover this in lesson 2.7 of Game Theory 101, the complete textbook. You can check the video description for more information about that. So here's the game. It looks a little bit complicated, but in fact, it's actually very straightforward. Player one begins the game by choosing whether to continue or end. If he ends, he gets two and she gets zero. If he continues, then player two moves. If she continues, then we keep playing this game. If she ends, then she gets three and player one gets one. So if we move on another step, then player one continues or ends. If he ends, then he gets four and she gets two and so forth. And we're going to do this process a hundred times over, hence the name centipede game. It's got a hundred legs until finally player two makes a move where at the very end of the game, she has to honor or defect. If she honors, then both players get a hundred. If she defects, then she gets 101 and he gets 99. So that's the game. You can think of this as though we are playing a game where at every move, if the player chooses to continue, then we add $2 to a pot. And at the very end, if we've continued all the way through and player two honors, then we split the pot 50-50 where both players are getting $100. So they're both getting half of the $200 pot. But at any given point, a player can end the game and take $2 more out of the pot than what the other player gets. The other player gets the remainder, but the player who ends early gets $2 more than that other player. So how do we solve this game? Well, you might be thinking it's going to be very difficult because we have so many different information sets. And in fact, we have more information sets than we see on the screen because of the dot, dot, dots. But in fact, this is going to be really easy because all it is is a very, very elongated version of backward induction. We just got to start at the end and work our way forward or work our way backward, and we're going to be fine. It's actually going to be pretty easy. So let's just start at the end here where player two is defecting or honoring. If she honors, she gets 100. If she defects, she gets 101. 101 is greater than 100. So that means she's going to defect here. So we take that piece of information and work our way backward a step. Now player one, if he ends, gets 100. If he continues, then player two defects and he gets 99. Well, 100 is greater than 99, which means he's going to end at his decision. And we take that piece of information and work back another step where if player two ends here, she gets 99. If she continues, then player one ends and she gets 98. 99 is greater than 98, so that means she's going to end here. And so this process is just going to repeat itself over and 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 over. You get the idea until we get all the way up to the beginning where player two is going to end at this choice right here. And because of that, if player one continues, she ends and he gets one. If he ends, then he gets two. Two is greater than one, which means he's going to end. And so the subgame perfect equilibrium is everyone ends at their given information set, which means the outcome of the game is for player one to end right at the very beginning, and he'll get two and player two will get zero. Now you'll notice that this is a commitment problem because if the players could credibly commit to continuing throughout the game, then we have this outcome here, which is much, much better for both players, where both players are earning 100 versus at the beginning of the game when player one ends, player one's getting two, and player two is getting zero. Those are much, much smaller figures than what happens if we could just somehow come up with a way of continuing all the way through and splitting $200 evenly 50-50. Now, what's interesting about the centipede game is that when we do experiments in laboratories where we get two players to play this game over dollars, then we don't actually see what the subgame perfect equilibrium predicts. We would predict that player one at the beginning of the game will just end things right off the bat. He'll get two and she'll get zero, and that's the end of it. What occurs in practice is that the players will actually play for a while, say until player two decides to end the game where she'll get 57 and player one will get 55. And so they're playing for a while and they're actually doing better than what we would expect them to do where they're getting this really lousy outcome. They're ending somewhere in between here and here. And so that's better for both players. And this creates an interesting dynamic where now we are wondering why the prediction that we're making given subgame perfect equilibrium and backward induction, we're seeing something different than actually what's happening in real life. So there's a discrepancy here, and I'm going to address why we see this discrepancy and whether this discrepancy is really a problem with game theory or it's actually something that we should expect given the assumptions that we're making. So join me in that video. That video will be very important if you're interested in doing any sort of mathematical modeling uh, using game theory. So I hope you, you enjoyed this video, and I hope to see you in the next video. Take care.